in this uh, part of the session, we're going to go through basically a little bit more of a hands-on uh, with the kill sort GUI and running kill sort, and with the Phi GUI and thinking about um, what kinds of things you might see uh, during using Phi to cure your spike sorting. Uh, so this is going to be sort of picking up from uh, what Maria has already told you and just going into, again, a bit more, a bit more detail, a bit more hands-on. Um, yeah, Sylvia will be monitoring questions again, so do uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand if you want to interject or, or ask in the Q&A, and, &A and uh, we'll try to answer it. Okay, so um, I'm just going to go through uh, this KillSort GUI that um, Marius already showed you and just say a bit more about what are the controls and settings and things. Um, Nick, sorry. Yeah. I think we wanted to let people know that they should not comment on the questions once we've answered them because we will probably not see it. So better to have a new question if you want us to answer. Okay, let's go for it. Great. And, and apologies for the background construction noise. Apparently today is the day they're drilling outside on the street. Um, okay, so uh, installing Killasort is pretty easy. Uh, there's some setup for compiling the GPU um, functions. Um, but once you set up your compiler correctly, you really should be able to come into MATLAB, add Killasort to the path, and type Killasort and press enter, and it will come up with this view. Um, so um, what are the functions uh, that you need to know about here? First of all, there's a help button, which says, welcome to Killasort. Here's some troubleshooting. Um, here's how to get help or create issues. Okay. Um, there's also controls, which um, brings up this little dialogue that tells you some of the different controls available to you. And in general, in these views over here, you can, uh, all three of these views, you can click on things um, and to, to sort of like navigate. Um, so uh, the first thing you would do is select a data file to load. Um, so it pulls up just a file browser, you pick a data file. Um, if you do that, it's automatically gonna set the same. Uh, and so the file you wanna pick is the file you got from your recording, which in this case, it was a Spike GLX recording. We got a .ap.bin file, um, which is this large uh, uh, file with all the spec data. Um, it'll automatically set the same working directory and results output directory, but you can pick a, a different working directory or a different results output directory if you prefer. Um, you will then pick a um, channel map. Um, so for instance, uh, uh, phase 3B1 will be your your normal uh, neuropixels um, 1.0 pro. I'm not sure why it's there three times, but in any case, um, and uh, after you do that, it ought to automatically um, sort of fill in the rest of these parameters and load up and show you some data. Okay, so um, as Marius mentioned, um, you can switch back and forth between showing the raw data versus the filtered data. Um, and from the filtered data, you can see the prediction and the residual. And Marius was flipping back and forth between slides, um, but the way I'm flipping back and forth in the GUI is, as it says in this, these controls, one, two, three, four, enable different data views. So if I press um, three, if I press three, it goes to the prediction. If I press two, it goes back to the filter. If I press four, it goes to the residual. And so this way you can really easily flip, flip back and forth uh, between filter and residual. Um, down this bar is supposed to be a timeline of the recording. You can flip through to different time points um, and check how the residuals look at all the different time points. Um, and again, you should be looking for a flat uh, and empty looking residuals, and you should be looking for the filtered data to match the prediction or the prediction to match the filtered data. Um, so that means Kilosort found all the right spikes at the right times, um, and they look correct. Um, you can also shift to a different view. Um, rather than this color map view, you can shift to a uh, traces view. And in the traces view, um, you literally are seeing the uh, filtered traces um, over time. Um, and you can see um, spike waveforms in these traces um, here and here and here, for instance. Um, and you can click over here to see which trace, which channels you're gonna see in the traces view. So there's a nice spike. Um, that spike is on these channels. If I go back to the um, original view, you can see that was this spike here. So because we're zooming in on just a few channels to see the traces, that spike ends up um, looking much bigger and more prominent uh, in this view. And just like before, I can uh, put the prediction, um, and now it's going to like over toggle them so you can sort of overlay uh, so I can see the prediction, the filtered, uh, and then the residual. 
And the point is that uh, the, the prediction looks quite a bit like the filter and the residual looks close to flat. Um, and that is all as it should be. So the residual is close to flat. Um, if I turn on the filter, um, the spike comes back. Okay. Um, and here you can see actually, this is a um, NeuroPixels 2.0 recording, which means we have the LFP in the file, which is why the raw data um, looks, looks very different. Um, but for your 1.0, the raw data will look pretty similar to the filter. Okay, um, let's see. So that's the browsing things. And then there's just a few other controls that, um, uh, you know, scroll with Alt, Shift, or Control. It's going to um, sort of zoom or scale around here. So like, for instance, if I scroll, I can sort of slide through the recording. Um, and if I Shift, Scroll, hopefully. I'm trying through TeamViewer, so maybe it's not working because of TeamViewer. In any case, um, you can sort of zoom in um, and zoom onto different channels, et cetera. OK, um, so that's basically how to view the data. Um, and hopefully it makes sense what you're viewing here and what you're looking for. Um, and then the parameters are over here. So you have the number of channels, which again, should have been set automatically for, for a NeuroPixels recording. This is going to work fine. Why is it 385 rather than 384? It's because the number of channels here, this is important, refers to the number of rows in the data file not the number of physical sites on the probe. And in a NeuroPixels data file, um, at least from Spike GLX, there's going to be 385 rows because the 385th one is the synchronization data. Um, but because that's a row in the data file, even though we're not going to load it here, um, uh, we still have to specify it so that the data can be written correctly. Sampling frequency um, time range, right now it's set to zero to infinity, meaning it's gonna take the whole file and run the whole file. If you're just testing stuff out, you could set this to say zero space 100, and then it'll just run say the first 100 seconds of the file. Um, that could be a way to run it really um, a lot faster um, and just check that everything's working. Um, this is using the newest version, this 2.5 that uh, Marius talked about and um, it has this parameter and blocks for registration. It has some description here, how you use that. Um, threshold. Uh, Lambda, AUC for split. So the AUC, yeah, um, basically there's some description on the wiki about these parameters. Um, I personally um, have never changed any of these parameters, but this is these are exactly the kind of parameters that um, Marius uh, indicated, you know, you should sort of like check how well things are working on your data set and then come back to these parameters if you want to make adjustments and you want to read on the wiki about exactly what these parameters do um, in order to understand how to make adjustments. For instance, if you find that you're getting too many um, too many low amplitude noise spikes, you could increase these thresholds. Um, again, you want to read about what the two different thresholds are, um, or or decrease them if you if you want to get lower amplitude spikes. Okay. Um, so that's basically it. I mean, really, um, once you've once you've tried it a couple times using the GUI is super quick because you just pick your data file and press run all, um, uh, and and that's pretty much everything that happens. Um, let me just show you quickly how to um, set advanced options. So if you click set advanced options, it will just tell you how to do it. Um, the way you do it is at the command line. Um, and uh, we'll just do that right now. So basically, um, let's, uh, let's do that. So if I do alt tab to go back to the command line. So uh, I'm going to run the first line that it told me to run, uh, which is getting the uh, the um, back end of the GUI. And then I have this um, set of options, ks.ops. Um, and here I can set any of the more advanced options. So if you want to set, for instance, um, someone asked earlier this morning about um, setting the filtering, this parameter fs high is the high pass filter cutoff. So I could do ks.ops fs high equals 500. And now um, I've got uh, 500. Um, and I think that that will automatically um, uh, update back to the degree, so it should be um, good to go. Nick, uh, commenting yep. on your little team, your um, box in the bottom. I don't know if you want to hide that. Thanks. Yeah. Someone wants to connect uh, to my team viewer? Um, Apparently. Okay. <laughs> Hackers, all of them. Uh, that's the right spirit. Okay, um, so the next thing I'm going to talk through, are there any questions about um, what I talked about so far? Give a sec. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. 
Um, so the output on the right from the filter view was a result of pre-processing, right? So if you hadn't done any of that yet, you wouldn't have gotten any of this. The pre, the, so yeah, so what happens is um, the, the pre-processing, the full pre-processing step, like what happens in the first part of when you run all, takes a few minutes, like five minutes to run. Um, but the GUI will run um, a very shortened version of that immediately, and it takes about 10 seconds. Um, and so when you when you load your data file, there's going to be, it'll, it'll take a few seconds um, because it will be running that like shortened version of the pre-processing. So it will be able to show you the filtered and um, whitened data as soon as you load the data before you run anything, actually. It won't be able to show you yet um, the, the prediction and the residual that you only get after you run everything. But it should show you both the raw and the filtered immediately. OK, thanks. So um, the next thing I'm going to tell you about is what you see when you run it, like what are the outputs. Um, so there's two, there's two kinds of outputs. One is the command line output. So I had just um, run this uh, before, before uh, we started. And so um, I had run kill sort, it brought it to GUI. And then when I clicked run all, it started doing this stuff. Okay. And um, what it's doing is um, first doing the pre-processing. Um, and it should result in something that says finished pre-processing. Um, and you can see it took 309 seconds, so it was about six minutes. Um, then it went into this kill sort 2.5 um, um, thing where it's uh, doing the shifting. Um, and you can see that took about 10 minutes, um, 600 seconds. And um, it detected about 1.1 uh, 1 .1 million spikes on the way. This is actually not too much. You can see that the, the recording that I have here looks like quite a bit um, sparser with spikes than the one that Maria showed you before. Um, one million spikes uh, over a, um, well, let's see, over a 45 minute recording is, is pretty poor yield actually, which should hope to get a uh, better yield than that. Um, if the whole recording had looks like this little segment here, um, we could have gotten 10 million spikes. Um, but in any case, the fact that I found a million spikes at least means that it's, it's working, it's finding something. Um, and so that's all well and good. And then it starts optimizing the templates. Um, you can tell it got through this um, after about 15 minutes um, and then um, went through um, a couple of rounds of that and finally finished after about, what is that, 20 minutes or something um, with 3.3 million spikes. And then the last step is um, doing some merging and splitting um, and then it, it'll be done. So this is um, a normal example of the kind of output you see, basically sort of reporting on its progress as it goes. Um, and the, really the only thing to check here, uh, it should take about um, a half an hour or so, like, like these time timestamps indicate here. Um, and really the only thing to check to make sure it's sort of working is just that you have some, some if you have a NeuroPixels recording that has you know 15 or 20 minutes or more in length, um, you really should have more than a million spikes. So you should get some spikes, um, you should get some units, um, like in the hundreds, um, and and that's about all there is to check in terms of the command line output. You also get some graphical output. Um, the main one is this plot. So this plot shows you the um, the um, first temporal components of the waveform. So each column is a is a neuron that it found or a unit, um, and this is showing its temporal component in samples, um, which is sort of flat and then has a dip um, in the darker color um, and then an increase again. And so that's, you know, as you know, that's what a spike looks like. It has a decrease and then an increase. Um, so that looks good. Um, and then the spatial component showing where these neurons are found on the probe. And we can sort of sanity check this because we saw in the GUI that uh, most of these neurons are in this upper part of the probe. And since channel zero is down here at the bottom of the probe, these guys are all on sort of channels, you know, 100 to 300. And indeed, uh, we see many spatial components found for channels 150 to 350, but not many found for the bottom of the probe. Um, so the bottom of the probe here was evidently in part of the brain that did not have many neurons. Um, and as long as that makes sense with what you saw in the raw data and uh, what you saw when you did the recording, then you can feel good about this having found neurons in the right place. This is showing the amplitudes of all the units and this one is the amplitudes relative to their spike counts. Um, and the amplitudes are in arbitrary units, so there's not too much to interpret there. 
um, but the spike counts are in, you know, spikes per second. And so you should um, see sort of normal range of things that you expect to see um, here. 10 to the first is 10. So there's lots of units around 10 or smaller spikes per second, um, and only a few up to around 100 spikes per second. So again, that's sort of, uh, well, you might know something about that for your brain region of interest or wherever you're recording, um, but that's about what you should expect uh, biologically. So just, just describing what's in these plots and sort of a way to sort of sanity check that it's roughly what you expect um, to, to see. Maybe a quick um, question. Mm -hmm. yep. um, if we move the probes during a recording, for example, insert deeper, should we do the sorting separately on the time segment for different depths? Uh, yes, you probably should um, uh, stop the recording, then move the probe, then start a new recording and sort them entirely separately. Um, I mean, if you if you are moving by, you know, 25 microns or something like that, or 50 microns, then maybe you could um, hope that kill sort 2.5 is good enough to uh, succeed um, there, as Marius uh, advertised that it, that we think it is. Um, but I think probably it would make more sense to just uh, stop and start again. Uh, this recording actually, so let me uh, use that to transition into these last two plots and then I'll take more questions. Um, so this this is, as I mentioned, using um, Kilosort 2.5 with the um, drift correction. And so it also produces, in that case, these two other plots, which are these drift maps. Um, and you can see this is one of these recordings that Marius mentioned where I've, I've um, done this sort of ground truth thing of wiggling the probe up and down. Um, normally, you would not expect to see this kind of motion, uh, but you would expect to see this kind of motion where things were moving a bit uh, up here. Um, and it produces this estimated drift trace. Um, and so you can see uh, whether that looks like it matches this and, and whether it looks like it uh, makes sense. Okay, any other questions about the Kilosort GUI or plots? Because uh, then I think we'll probably move ah, on. And there. one just popped up. Any rule of thumb about minimum recording duration to be able to sort spikes? Yeah, so good question. Um, so the more spikes that you have, the better Kilosort is going to be able to do, especially as you get for lower and lower spike count units. So, I mean, you think about um, is that spike count or spike rate? Now I've got myself confused. In any case, um, if you think about these units down here that have really low rates, um, the fewer spikes that you have to work with, the um, harder it is for an algorithm to be able to sort of identify those that set of spikes as a unit. So uh, as a rule of thumb, I would probably uh, recommend doing at least 45 minutes um, of recording as a, as a minimum. I mean, you certainly can do do less, and you can still spike sort well, um, especially for the high firing rate units. Um, but given that you know low firing rate units go down to something like 0.1 spikes per second in most parts of the brain, especially cortex, um, you know 0.1 spikes per second is one spike every 10 seconds. It's, it's six spikes a minute. So I mean, just think about that. Like, if you want some hundreds of spikes for that unit to work with, you're going to need like you know an hour of recording. So the longer you can do, the better, basically, in terms of your spike sorting outcomes. And several related questions. How long are your recordings? Do you record everything in one long file? Did you ever try recording in separate files and concatenate them? And how would you deal with a gap in which you didn't record? Yeah, so you can, uh, so I always just, for simplicity and clarity, uh, I always just record in one, one file and I have like different different behavioral tasks or stimulus protocols um, happening at different times within that file. Um, uh, it just, yeah, for me, it makes everything easier downstream um, uh, because you don't have to worry about concatenating and working out the gaps, et cetera. However, you definitely can do it that way. In fact, you can, um, especially in Spike GLX, I know, um, probably in OpenEFIS too, um, you can like trigger the files to record like trial by trial, you get a different file every trial if, if you were comfortable with that way or want to do it that way. Um, so there, there's definitely ways to do it. And um, if you check out the Spike GLX website, I know Bill has provided, Bill and Jennifer have provided um, some functions and code that allows you to, uh, you know, sort of as in as streamlined a way as possible, deal with like concatenating and resplitting the files and all that sort of stuff. Um, you would definitely, I think if you had that situation where you had like a few different blocks or even like a, a number of different blocks, you'd want to concatenate them all um, to give to kill a sword um, and then back out the correct spike times afterwards. Right, and how long does it take to sort one hour data from one book? 
Um, well, kill story runs in, in like I said, um, faster than real time. It should take about a half an hour or so, um, maybe 45 minutes um, for an hour recording. So uh, that's not too big of a problem. The problem is going to be the next step, which is uh, the, the, the manual spike sorting. I think that's it for now. OK, so um, yeah, I, I think, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think that the, you know the whole point of the GUI is to make it like relatively easy to get in and run kill sort on your data, um, and and hopefully you can have not much problem with that. So what do you get at the end? Um, so um, what you get is this set of files. So you started out with this um, ap.bin file, which in this case was forty seven gigabytes. Um, that was your original file uh, that you put in, and now you've gotten a whole bunch of files output. Um, there is description on the um, FI wiki about what exactly all of these files are. Um, Marius gave that link in his talk and, and um, we can make sure you get it, um, where there's a page that describes exactly what's in all of these files. Um, but the upshot is that all of these files are the ones that FI uh, needs to allow you to sort of uh, load this data set and look at the results um, and sort of review for quality, uh, again, as, as Marius mentioned. And so that's what we'll get into next. Um, do I need to say anything about any of these in particular? I don't think so at this point. But basically, you should get um, in your directory, in your output directory, right? We picked a results output directory here. Um, in that output directory, you ought to get um, all of these files like the amplitude, set MPY, channel map, set MPY, et cetera, um, if, it's, if it completes successfully. And it'll give you messages down here, by the way. I think that's clear, but um, kill sort finished saving data to this directory. So if all that happens correctly, then you're good.